everyone, and welcome to Talks at Google. Today, we're here to welcome recipe developer, food stylist, and cookbook author, Sp Susan Spungen, as she demonstrates two recipes from her latest book, Open Kitchen, Inspired Food for Casual Gatherings. Susan will also discuss food styling and photography tips, working on hit movies such as Eat, Pray, Love, and how people can adapt their holiday plans to get together over delicious food while social distancing. So without further ado, because we have two amazing demos, uh, let's bring on Susan. Hi, Ida. Hi, Susan. Thank you again for joining us. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm coming to you from East Hampton, New York here, all the way across the country. It's so nice to be able to see a, a glimpse of your amazing kitchen there. So Thanks. <laughs> so today you're going to be demoing um, two dishes from your cookbook, right? Yes, I am. And they happen to be right next door to each other in the book, which I'm super happy about. One is the root vegetable tian right here, which uh, well, I'll tell you about that in a second. And the other is the caramelized fennel with citrus and olives. So you've made it really easy for me to by keeping them on consecutive pages. <laughs> but I should say that we chose these recipes partly because they're good plant-based recipes that, well, actually are easily made plant-based. I have so many vegetable recipes in my book, even though that's not really the theme. Um, I eat a lot of vegetables and actually I'm going to show you my table here, which is like full of produce and tons of squash and stuff from the farm that we uh, belong to. We have a CSA near here that that's we uh, pick vegetables. So yeah, that's the way I cook. <laughs> Well, great. Yeah, and um, they, they look like they're just, I don't know, perfect for this time of year absolutely. and um, perhaps for our holiday tables that are coming yes, up. Yes, absolutely. The Tian especially makes a great um, side dish for any holiday gathering, whether it's your immediate family or whatever. I'm going to have a small outdoor gathering, I think, for Thanksgiving Day. Um, but this dish also makes a really great vegetarian main course. Wonderful. Well, how are you going to be doing that outdoor um, gathering? <sighs> well, I'm hoping for the best with the weather, but I'm calling it for lunchtime, um, like 1.30. And um, I'm just, you know, hoping it won't be too cold because we're here in New York and I'm, I'm going to make a rain day for Friday. And I'm just inviting really two other couples who are also neighbors who we've socialized a little bit with over the summer and who we feel comfortable bubbling with. And, um, you know, just because, I don't know, I, I can't not celebrate Thanksgiving. I'm going to cook a turkey outside on my Traeger grill it makes great turkey and, you know, we're, I'm going to have everybody bring something and that's what we're going to do. Well, wonderful. Well, <laughs> let's get started on yeah. this dish and um, I'll ask a few questions about your new book, sure. Kitchen. Yeah. Uh, the one question I have is how did you come with, with this name? Oh, well, it's partly inspired by this kitchen. You see how it's a very open kitchen and a lot of people have an open kitchen, but the, I like the double entendre of open kitchen because it's about also welcoming people into your home, but it's also about the way that you might have to adjust your cooking a little when you actually have a kitchen like this because everyone can see what you're doing. So you have to, uh, uh, be a little more prepared and you know it's not like a, the old-fashioned kitchen where you could close the door and you'd entertain your guests in another room it's like this is where the party happens so you better kind of look like you know what you're doing right um, so my book is full of sort of what I call get ahead tips um, that will help you organize yourself in the kitchen better so that it's actually makes it more fun and more enjoyable to actually be the cook when you do that. So um, like even for today, I had to get everything kind of prepped in advance a little bit. So I'd be ready for you. So you're my guest today. Oh, thank you for inviting me into your home. Also, the, the get ahead makes it a makes it possible for the hostess or the host to be part of the party, right? Not just uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And not to have a sink full of dishes when you're 
friends come over or, you know, it's time to eat. I, I like, I like to have things. I like to, I'm a clean as you go kind of person. So, um, you know, when you've done kind of the heavy lifting ahead of time, you can clean up and you're ready to eat. So that's, that's the way I like to do it. Now I know not everybody, uh, is organized that way, but all of the recipes can be made straight through as well. So well, wonderful. Well, why don't we get started on some? Okay. Of the yeah. So I did a few things in advance because I didn't think you were going to want to watch me uh, do some tedious, more tedious job. So I've uh, I've made this chickpea puree, uh, which, to be honest, I you could use any bean especially white beans though. Um, so I, I actually made one that I'm not gonna show you yet ahead of time so that we can get right to it. Um, and that one actually didn't have two cans of garbanzo beans in my, in my pantry, I thought I did. So I, I had a can of butter beans, so I used those. So basically you're just taking the beans straight out of the can and putting them in a food processor with a little bit of enough of the liquid to uh, make it like this texture, you know, spreadable. Um, and if you don't have a food processor or you're too lazy to wash it, you could just put them in a bowl with a fork and mash them up. The idea, I love that. yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea is just to um, not only add a little bit of protein to this dish, which I like as a main course, but you'll see how it gives me a, uh, when I'm trying to arrange the vegetables, it makes it a lot easier because they kind of stand up in this puree here. So I, ha I, mean, I am going to show you how I slice things on this mandolin. Oh, gosh, I left my little safety glove out in the sun. Can I run out and get it? I was trying sure. to try. And I'll kind of give a little bit more of history of who Susan is because she's not just, um, she's written three cookbooks. Uh, let's see, they are a collection for modern cook what's a hostess to do um, and strawberries. And she's also the co-author of um, the Martha Stewart hors d'oeuvre cookbook, which garnered a lot of attention. Um, movies that she's done with was not just eat, love, pray, eat, I can't eat, pray, love. <laughs> eat, pray, love, but also um, it's confidential. And no, 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 it's complicated. Oh, it's complicated. No, yeah, no, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. I, I mean, all I remember about that movie was the uh, the amazing croque monsieur that came out of the oven. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Julia and Julia, which was um, a venerable uh, food movie, right? So in, in many ways, you've you've been part of the three top food movies. And well, there's a lot, but yes, three really great ones. I would agree. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much more, actually. I don't know. How to there is. It there is. Hopefully we'll get to that. But I'll, I'm going to start on this and then you can uh, kind of come in and out with questions anytime you want. So do you see this kind of weird glove I have on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're ever going to use a mandolin, now I love using a mandolin and this recipe almost kind of requires it because you have to get the vegetables paper thin. But a lot of people, uh, amateurs and professionals can cut themselves quite easily on this little gadget. So I use mine all the time, but my life was changed when I got this glove, which costs like, I don't know, $5 on, you know, you can order it anywhere online. Right. And um, I believe it's called a cut glove. Yeah, and if people use it also if you want to open oysters or something like that, it really protects you from any like little stabs or cuts. And I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to people's house for a party and they've got a big bandage on their finger. And I was like, what happened? And like, oh, I used my mandolin. So, you know, it's very it's easy. a wise investment. <laughs> a wise investment. In fact, they should sell them together. <laughs> So I'm just going to show you how it works because it's this one has a little bit of an adjustment on it. And depending on the, you're trying to get like, this, these are kind of fibrous. These are parsnips. Depending on the uh, vegetable that you're doing, you might need to change the uh, the blade thickness because these are really kind of tough and fibrous. So it makes it a little bit harder. But the idea is that you've got a bunch of different vegetables that are um, roughly the same diameter so i have everything i need right here where's my knife come on all right here it is do you have any tricks on making sure that they are roughly that same diameter well just when you're shopping like look for the skinny sweet potatoes like not the big fat ones just look at everything and pick things that are roughly the same diameter 
So um, actually all of these vegetables sort of are, but as we know, sometimes the sweet potatoes would be huge or you know, the beets could be huge. So you wanna pick ones that, I mean, as you can see, these are roughly the same. Mm -hmm. And the parsnip always has a big, thick part. So see, those are the hardest to cut. These are, these are a little bit easier. I've already done some of this in advance, but I just wanted to show you. Well, if you don't have a mandolin, make sure you get that cut glove um, as well <laughs> for safety reasons. And yeah. uh, they, they are a really fun um, tool to have in the kitchen, e even in the summer, right? For making oh, yeah. a salad. I use the, mine all the time. And it's actually, um, you can, everything can be so beautiful. There's also a shaved vegetable salad in the book that also relies on a mandolin. And I love shaved fennel salad. Who hasn't had a great shaved fennel salad in a restaurant? And you can't really do that without the mandolin. That's how you do it. You shave it super thin. So I strongly encourage you to spend, I don't know, it's like 20 bucks for this one. So this one's Kyocera, which I love. So. That's what you got to do. All right, so I'm just going to try to show you. Let me show you over here. I've already done more of the vegetables in advance. Now I've got beets and sweet potato beets, sweet potatoes. Wait, maybe you can't see everything. Beets, yeah, yeah. beets, sweet potatoes, and parsnip. But you could change it up if you have other root vegetables that you want to use. If you wanted to have potatoes or um, you could use fennel in this as well. And this tian, it's really, it's a South, um, like a recipe that's traditionally, traditionally from the South of France. Traditionally, it's a summer recipe that has eggplant, tomato, zucchini. And that's good, delicious, but I wanted to make a sort of more autumnal version of this um, dish. So that's what we have here. So basically you're gonna pick up a few of each vegetable, a few slices of each, because it's not necessary to uh, kind of layer uh, one at a time. That would be like kind of ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to pick up a little bit of everything, including the red onion, which I also sliced on the mandolin. And then we're just going to start sort of shingling them. Now I did that. You'll see I did the other one in a round dish, but I only had one round dish. So now I'm going to do this one. Can you see what I'm doing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, playing cards actually would really help <laughs> with the practice with this. It is. It's, kind of, it's kind of like dealing cards or playing cards. Yeah. So you could also and, probably do this dish as individual dishes. You, if you could. Would. Yes. Okay. Yes. If you have individual baking dishes, it actually doesn't take any longer to arrange them in an individual dish than it does in this dish. So, and that's a really beautiful, fun thing to do if you want to get a little bit fancy, right? Mm -hmm. No, um, you mentioned that this is actually based off of a summer dish, the tian. Yeah. It, yeah. Could we use the same recipe and, and put this, the beans on the bottom mm -hmm. and use the same vegetables? Oh, 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 you mean the summer vegetables? Yeah, or the so if we don't have a recipe for well, it. Well, you know what? You could find a million recipes online for the traditional tiam because the timing might be a little different. This one might okay. cook longer mm -hmm. and covered because you'll see we have to cook this one covered because otherwise these vegetables probably would never soften up enough. So they need to steam for the first like 35 minutes. So um, the timing would just be a little off. but. The, uh, the the sort of bean layer is kind of my innovation, and you could um, you could add that to the traditional tomato one, or um, yeah, no, I was going to say baba ganoush, but I don't think that would work as well. But um, any kind of puree, because the thing is, you see how it's holding the vegetables in place. Yeah, it's anchoring it so that uh -huh. it doesn't yeah. fall down as you're shingling. Exactly, exactly. It's so, already just beautiful. Yeah, and I'm going to show you the, the finished one in a minute. What so, did I do first? Do them in the same order if you can remember each time. Yeah, go on. So, what, so what were you, gonna you actually were, um, you went to school as an artist, right? You're, I did. I did. I studied fine arts um, when I was, you know, college age. Mm -hmm. And I actually didn't finish school. So I, you know, one of the, I, I kind of want to write a book someday that's the college dropouts guide to life um, because me and many other successful people did not finish college and God only knows what's going to happen now, right? With all the poor kids that are in school right now. And um, 
Yeah, I just, I wanted to be an artist. I really did. But because of some other things going on in my life, I just decided that I didn't want to finish school. And, uh, and then I sort of slowly but surely drifted towards uh, food as a career. I had always worked in restaurants, even when I was in school. And even I took a sort of accidental gap year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you well, know what that is? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I wish I, took, I wish I took an accidental <laughs> <laughs> gap year. That's when you, well, for me, it was because I didn't finish my college application. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's an accidental gap year. So um, they didn't have a name for it then. It was just like, you know, I mean, it's it's amazing I got as far as I did in my life because I really was not a very motivated young person, I got to tell you. Um, so, you know, it was, it was, it's a miracle, really. <laughs> well, I mean, it didn't stop your talent from showing through it and bringing you to some amazing opportunities. Um, one of them was which that you were the food editor for yeah. Martha Stewart Living from like its yeah. founding in 91 yeah. Yeah. To, to 2003. And yeah. Is, do you, is that part of the reason why you, you got into the movies? Because you've done so much. You've food styling. Um, no, it was totally accidental, to be honest. Once again, my life is just full of accidents. Um, <laughs> uh, so, no, I just, I mean, I, I think I was always very interested in translating food to various visual forms. So, um it certainly, but it wasn't really something I pursued, but it was something I was interested in for sure. I just never really thought about it that much. I mean, I loved movies I had seen up until then, like Babette's Feast or um, Eat, Drink, Man, Woman, you know, these movies that beautiful food movies that I was familiar with or Tampopo. Those are some of the best ones I can think of off the top of my head. And I loved them. Um, so I loved, um, there was actually even a scene in the movie fried green tomatoes that I was just like, it was just some pies on a table. And I was like, wow, they look so amazing. You know, I really was like taken with them, but I never really thought about, oh, well, how, how could I get into like doing this? So I, um, you know, it just, it really just happened accidentally. Uh, Nora Ephron called me and asked me if I wanted to work on her movie. <laughs> And what do you think I said? <laughs> yeah, there's. I said, I said, it, I said, is this really Nora Ephron? That's what I said. Because <laughs> she actually called me herself. Wow, that's amazing. And and that was for which movie? Julie and Julia, which was Julia. the first one that I did. Great. And and what was that like? Because Stanley Tucci was also in The Big Night, right? Oh yeah, which is also another great food movie, obviously. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, what was that like? Well, Stanley was great. He didn't actually have a lot of food or eating, a few eating scenes, not too many food scenes. Uh, he wasn't really hands-on, he only ate. Um, <laughs> and uh, all right, look at that. We've got our outer ring done. You see that? This yeah. is the perfect thing to do while you're talking to someone. <laughs> Well, I mean, your art, your artistic background really comes out here. Uh, the, and for all of you who have not yet seen the book, it is just a visually stunning book. The 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 photos are so inspiring. Like you just want to cook everything. And thank you. Um, it, uh, yeah, I. Well, I we like eat with our eyes, right? We eat with do. our eyes. Yeah. And I really, for me. Um, you know, it's a really important part of what I do is like when I when I develop a recipe and I think about a recipe that I want to create, the visual, it's sort of hand in hand. I'm not just thinking about, uh, you know, how it's going to taste, although that's a, that's as, as important. I don't go for visuals over uh, taste, but they just go hand in hand for me. So color is super important like this is a perfect example right here well it's yeah. funny because when you look at this and all of the all of the cuts when you look at the dish it looks like it would take forever to make but it really yeah it goes quite quickly right it's the right. preparation like you said mm -hmm. the ahead yeah. um, the cooking ahead but right. once you get this done, can you now take it at this point and just put it in the refrigerator? Oh, and yeah. That is the, the great thing. Now, all these extra scraps, by the way, I'm going to make a soup out of them, um, which will be great. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you can. Um, um, 
I'm sorry, what did you just ask me? Say oh, I was just wondering, do you hold this dish at oh, this yeah. point in time or do you yeah, yeah. cook it? I could, yeah. And then that is in the book, in my timing tips. Up to one day ahead, the tian can be assembled or completed completely ahead of time, reheat if desired. Either way, this one actually reheats pretty well, but if you were doing this for a party or you know a dinner or something, you would just take this right as it is and just cover it, put it in your fridge and it'll be fine. Um, if you did something with raw potatoes, you might not be able to do that because um, the potatoes would turn brown. But the beauty of these vegetables is they don't turn brown. So, and everything's very dry. It's not gonna get wet or anything. Um, well, so it's perfectly great thing to do ahead of time. And then you can just pop it in the oven. And let me tell you, it smells so good when it's cooking. So you have that, you know, when your guests are coming over, well, someday when we have guests again, but um, <laughs> um, we'll get back to that. Yes. Yeah. We want people to smell the food when they come in or I do anyway. So now all we have to do, and what if you were doing this ahead, I would wait to do this part. We're going to put olive oil. Now, do you want an extra virgin olive oil or? Yeah, something? for this, okay. for this you do, because you want that good flavor of the extra virgin olive oil. Now you can, if you don't mind getting your hands dirty, because I think in the recipe I say to use a brush and that's because you really want to get the oil all over everything. But um, if you don't like getting your hands dirty, then use a brush. <laughs> I mean, if you do mind, if you do mind. Right. I don't mind. I wash my hands, unfortunately, like so many times every day. So then we're going to season it with salt and pepper. Do you want to be generous with the seasoning? Or? Yeah, pretty generous, pretty generous because there's nothing in there yet. So, I mean, you don't want to go crazy. Did you see how much? I, I think the recipe tells you how much. Yeah, the recipe says a teaspoon of salt. So. That's pretty generous, but it serves uh, six to eight. But honestly, the vegetables have such nice flavor that you don't have to, if you don't like to eat a lot of salt, you could hold back a little bit. And then we have some garlic that I already did because I, I knew you didn't want to watch me chop a bunch of garlic. <laughs> that would be annoying. And again, totally optional if you don't want to use garlic, but it really gives it a lot of flavor. And then it kind of toasts on top. So it's not like super garlicky. Mm. So it kind of sweetens up and caramelizes. That sounds like Oh, lovely. yeah, it does. And then I have Parmesan, and it's mixed with some fresh thyme that I got just in my garden. Hasn't been cold here yet. So, and thyme, my thyme will last like half, most of the winter, if not all of the winter here. Yeah, well, we, we uh, have realized that a lot of people now have gardens and windowsill yeah. gardens. So that's yeah. wonderful. I know, definitely more people, more and more people are um, are planting things, just like they did in World War II, right? <laughs> Victory Gardens, yes. Yeah. So, Sorry, I stepped out for a second. Go ahead. No problem. Um, I was just wondering, you know, your career has has been a lot about styling of food and. Mm -hmm. um, taking the photographs. Do you have any tips for all of us who are taking more pictures oh, yeah. on the Instagram? I do. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, I, it really depends on the look that you like, but I mean, if you're home and you're taking pictures, which is probably what we're doing, right? Um, you need to go around your house and find the best light. Like, don't just assume it's wherever you put down your plate. I mean, if you're lucky, you have great light there. But, um, like, I know the couple of spots, and it depends on the time of day, that are nice light here in my house. And also, I have a couple of surfaces that I use. Like, And these don't have to be, you know, something you buy. There are places to buy surfaces online. But you might just have a really great table or a nice piece of linen or... I have this old, like, um, beautiful tray that is big enough to use as a surface, and everything looks great on it. That's like my sort of dark and moody surface. I'm going to show you. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna get over. Hold on. A dark and moody surface. That's a, yeah. that's a great description. So some things you want dark and moody, and other things you want bright and light. So this is like this old um, tray. Can you see it? Oh, wow. Yeah. What it's really beautiful. 
it's like I don't know what it is. It's like bronze or oh. something. But it's just a beautiful surface and it has some like variations in the surface and it also see how it reflects light really beautifully. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of texture and warmth. Yeah, yeah. So you want to look for things like that. Or if you have marble counters, those are great. If you have stone, any kind of stone counters, those are great. But it depends on the light. Like I have beautiful stone counters, but I don't really like the light so much in this room because I have windows all around, which is amazing. And I have skylights. So the light is kind of very too even. And it's better if you have directional light if you know okay. what I mean. Yeah. So I like this back bedroom that um, has like, it's very dark and then it has a lot of light from the window. That is usually the most dramatic. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. And then if you don't get a good shot, don't forget, there's all kinds of ways you can manipulate the photograph afterwards. But, um, you know, I, I don't do as much, I only do some little tweaks and I try to, um, I try to uh, get it in camera as much as possible. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Is that a good start? That's a great There's start. So I, have more things more things. <laughs> I have a lot okay. more questions, but I think um, if you could just tell us about like, what temperature to put the can yes. in yep, and yep. how long. Let me get my uh, basement. It probably won't spill over, but just in case you're up, just in case it does, it's always a good idea when you're having a baking, uh, baking something like this to put it on top of a baking sheet. So I've tightly put foil on it because mm -hmm. you want it to steam. This is not a just lay some foil on top. The okay, oven so you're sealing the edges. Yeah, yeah, you really want to seal it. So the oven's already heated to 375, which okay. is, um, you know, 375 is a great temperature when you want something to cook kind of slowly, but you still want a little bit of browning. 350, you're not going to get any of that. 400 is too hot. So this is, you know, your universal sort of hot baking temperature. So I'm going to put this in the oven for 25 minutes, and then I'm going to take off the foil and cook it another, I think, 35, um, 25 to 30 after that. So At the same I, temperature. Yes, at the same temperature. All you have to do is just take off the foil. So I'm going to put this one in, okay? Well, that's so nice to know that you don't have to go in and remember to change the temperature. No, no, no. I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> and here, here's the one that I baked just before we started. Oh, that's and lovely. That's it. I should have mentioned that you don't need um, to use the cheese, of course, if you are a completely plant-based eater. Um, you can just leave that off, or you could put some panko breadcrumbs, some crunchy breadcrumbs, just moisten them with a little bit of oil in a bowl, and then sprinkle those on, just so that you have a little something on top to give it a little, a little texture. Flavor. Yeah, or you could even use um, like ground walnuts, or there's all kinds of things you could put instead of cheese. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, it's so nice to have those kinds of substitutions to know them. Are oh, those yeah. also listed? I noticed that in your famous kale salad recipe yeah, that yeah. you offered a lot of variations. Yeah. I think you had started like a kale salad for the generations with that recipe. <laughs> yeah, that recipe, which ran on Epicurious in, I think, 2013 um, as a Thanksgiving side dish um, suggestion, uh it's really like it's one of the most popular recipes on the epicurious site and people just go crazy for it and uh which is great i love kale salad i actually don't really like kale cooked that much i only like it raw um i don't know i kind of like i don't know there's something about the texture of it cooked that i don't love so i'm a big kale mas massager, massager. <laughs> yeah we had kale salad for, with our dinner last night which was great so this smells amazing and this is a pie dish which is perfect for this like if you have a deep dish ceramic pie dish it's kind of the perfect vessel um but as you saw i did one in like an oval gratin mm -hmm. and that works fine too that's beautiful thank you so, so much do you want me to taste it on camera uh, yeah <laughs> i love it when people taste their own food <laughs> i'm just gonna stick a um, fork in it because you know yeah i made a what? Everything's you want to cook it so it's nice and soft, right? Right. And you want to make sure that you get some of that that lovely yeah. puree, right? It's so good. Well, when you're serving it, I'll show you. For 
each serving, you can scoop down into the um, into the bottom and make sure each person is getting a little bit of what's underneath. I love how the beets bleed into it and just give yeah. everything that kind of earthy yeah. color. Yeah, and you almost don't know the chickpea layer is there, but mm -hmm. mm. oh, it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's that's coming on to And I haven't had lunch yet. Thing. <laughs> I haven't had lunch yet, so. Oh, Actually, amazing. when I was developing this recipe, I had um, some friends over that weekend, and uh, I, I remember I served it for lunch at room temperature, and it was really good, so. So that, yeah, that is really a great suggestion because um, sometimes when you're entertaining, you only have one oven, you have yeah. one right stove, et cetera. Yeah. And that, that right. real estate is hard to Absolutely. come by. And yeah, this will stay warm though for quite a while. Like just if you have it in a nice heavy dish and cover it with foil, it'll stay warm for a while, so. That's great. And also in the back of your book, you had mentioned yeah. like certain menus and how mm -hmm. to pick those and to consider yeah. all of that equipment real estate oh, yeah. that you have. So um, just a, a note if you get the book definitely go into the back there's some great rest you know menus already created but then susan's created the book to actually address different parts of uh, uh, entertaining yeah and um to to just pick it through it's kind of like flashcards right. like you just right and i know that you know maybe the the concept uh <laughs> unfortunately my, my book came out march 3rd as you know i was supposed to be there and um the second or third week of March and yeah. I didn't come. Um, and, uh, you know, so lots of people, even though the recipes were supposed to be geared towards entertaining, uh, many, many people have been cooking on, during lockdown from my book and enjoying it a lot. So that made me so happy. <laughs> That's great. Well, you know, that brings us to one of our core, yeah. uh, story questions. And it's oh. since we've been in quarantine, what yes. has been your favorite quick go-to meal to make? Oh gosh, I have so many. Um, I have so many. Um, I make a lot of soups. My husband and I make a lot of soups. Sometimes we take our leftovers and make soups out of them. Um, or sometimes I meal prep and make a couple of soups. And then sometimes we even combine them. <laughs> and what, And I also usually make like, a. I see I meal prep. So it's kind of hard to, uh, it's not always that. If a really quick one would be, um, would be a turkey burger, honestly. Oh, that sounds <laughs> That's, Sometimes we enjoy just having like a burger dinner and we get out all of the condiments and um, we have lettuce and tomato. I call it burger deluxe. So that's fun too. But well, I like making soup with meatballs or even sometimes we put frozen dumplings in our soup, which is really good. Mm. So. Yeah, yeah. Very, that's uh, the very Korean where they have the mandu inside of their tofu soups, um, right? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Or I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, really, dumplings are great in anything that has some broth. So they, that's been a fun thing. Because when, when we go into the city, which we don't that often, we stop at H Mart, which is the Korean grocery store. Mm -hmm. And we stock up on frozen dumplings and noodles and things like that. Oh, so that's a good tip for everybody in quarantine. You can have like yeah. soup with dumplings and noodles and that's a yeah. fun meal. Yeah. Right. And then actually one time we, uh, we have a local like seafood store and they did curbside for during the, I think they're still doing it, but so you never even had to go inside. And like one night we just had like shrimp, like cold shrimp cocktail, cooked shrimp. I just picked up cooked shrimp and we had dumplings and maybe one other like vegetable component. And that was a great dinner too. I recorded all of my dinners in my phone. So. <laughs> so do you have an Instagram where we can all go and get inspiration? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. It's my, it's my name, Susan Spungen. So S U S A N S P U N G E N. And please follow me. I think you'll have fun. Yeah. I think that'll be great just for if you need any um, quarantine meal inspiration. Yeah. yeah. So you have another dish for us to see, right? Yes, I do. And this one involves fennel. Um, I'm going to use this, well, this bigger one. This is a, this is what I would call a big bulb of fennel. So <laughs> this one is, because sometimes they're really small. That's the, tr the trouble when you're a cookbook author. This is the second dish. Caramelized fennel with citrus and olives. You see, this is my personal copy. It's full of tabs and... <laughs> it's like my working copy. I've done so many, um, I've done a lot of like Instagram lives and 
various other things. Well, I know I pulled out about 25 sticky notes before I put the book behind me. I yeah. it would look nice, so. <laughs> so this one, we're, we're cutting the fennel. I've already trimmed it, again, to spare you uh, watching me do prep. So fennel always has this core. It's a little bit bright in here, so okay. you can see? Yeah, right yeah. there. So it has that core. So you want to like kind of keep as much of that intact as you can, because in this recipe, it's going to hold together the wedges. And if they fall apart a little, it's not really a problem. Just for fun, I'm going to probably put that into my um, my soup that I've got going. I'm going to make a soup with all the scraps. <laughs> so basically, the recipe says one inch wedges, and you're thinking, well, it's a wedge. So how do I measure it? It's like at the back. When when someone tells you a one inch wedge, it's the width of the sort of okay. back of the wedge that you want to go with. The widest part. Yeah, the widest part. And it's important to cut things the way a recipe says if you want the, if you want to depend on the times given in the recipe. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if you cut them much thicker, they might take longer. People sometimes don't realize how important that is. How important the cut affects the the end yes. product. That was a little knife tip that I just gave you. Did you see how like? So I didn't slip, I sort of rock my knife in very gently and then I can push down. But sometimes people, if you are cutting like squash or something, it's so hard to cut, just be very like, kind of get that knife in there securely and then you can push down. Oh, all right, we've got- Great our... safety tip, thank you. <laughs> it is, I know I'm all about safety. So we're gonna have, uh, let me see if I can move my camera over, sorry, to the stove a little bit. Ah, oh, okay. All right, so it's a part of a funny angle, but you can see it a little bit, right? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna turn on the, uh, the, the burner. I've got a big pan there, and um, I'm doing it over like medium high. You wanna kind of get some heat going there. And we're gonna use two tablespoons of butter. I mostly cook with olive oil for the most part, but um, I'm, Sort of a healthy cook, but I do indulge as well. So, but for this recipe, because you want to get this sort of caramelization going, you want to use butter. You could use olive oil, it would still be good, but um, I'm using butter, two tablespoons, which I don't need to measure. Oh, actually it was supposed to be one tablespoon. Oh no, two tablespoons of butter, one tablespoon of honey. So we're gonna melt that and I'm using this beautiful honey. Now did that come out of uh, a local? Area. This one's not local. I usually, this was one that um, a company called Natura sent me. They have beautiful products from all over. And this is raw, single origin forest honey. <laughs> I don't know where it's from. Ethiopia. Oh, Ethiopia? Wow. Yeah. That's and definitely the, not local. No, no, no. But you know, the cool thing about honey is that it kind of keeps forever. And you can collect honey like when you travel because at least you could imagine that it has some of the terroir of the place, right? That's a great uh, tip for traveling and remembering a yeah. place of your travel. It lasts for years. Honey doesn't go bad ever. Great. Um, I have another question. Out yeah. uh, what inspired you to get into cooking? Oh, well, you know, I just, I always loved it, to be honest. Like, even from the time I was um, really young, I I loved to bake and be in the kitchen. And still, this is like, it's totally my happy place. And it just, it honestly was very natural. For me, it wasn't like, and then also a natural extension of art. I like to create things, right? I'm a creative person. So um, it's just applying those sort of same skills and same loves to food as I did to for art. So it just became my art form, really. So that's what inspired me. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. I hope that's a good answer. Oh, there's no bad answer. <laughs> so you see how this is like sizzling now. We're going to put the fennel in and we're going to get it to all fit. It should fit um, if you have the right size bulb and it's okay if it's crowded. Yeah, that's perfect. And I'm going to salt it. And I'm going to cook it. We can keep talking because this is like, remember I said it was the perfect kind of recipe for uh, talking in between. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I'm gonna well, cook it for like six to eight minutes. So, okay, and then I'm so. gonna cook it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, in the so, meantime, I'm gonna show you how to do the orange, but keep going. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the tricks of making a perfect Supreme is actually <laughs> always worth sharing with people. Yeah. I'm so glad you know the name. <laughs> I actually have a favorite knife in my apartment in the city. That's like a steak knife. It's kind of like this one. Um, mm -hmm. it's like a serrated, like an old fashioned, like serrated steak knife. That's like my favorite one to use, but I'm going to use this one. Um, actually, sometimes I use more than one knife to do this. So the first thing is to cut the top and bottom. These are Cara Cara oranges, which I managed to find. Um, they're not really in season yet. These are from Chile. So Cara Cara, what makes those different than a regular? Well, they're, they're actually a cross between pink grapefruit and I think a navel orange. And so they have this beautiful pink color. They are beautiful, much darker than a regular orange. And a little bit of that slight bitterness that grapefruit has. Um, it's just a different flavor, but also, again, it's color that I am going for here. So I think about color a lot when I cook. Uh, what about um, texture? Do you think about the... Oh, yeah, texture? of course, of course, of course, always. That's why you want a little crunch in whatever you're making or... I always think about textures. In fact, last night, my salad was a study in textures, my kale salad. I put everything in there. I like to have a lot of different flavors popping. Like I had, it wasn't my usual, I don't even think I have this variation in my kale salad uh, recipe. Uh, I had, let's see, kale, purple daikon, shaved real thin on the mandolin, but uh, it kind of went Greek. I had one beautiful heirloom tomato left over from a few weeks ago. I think they're out of season now. Um, feta, tomato, radish, kalamata olives, pomegranate seeds. Oh, wow. It was really good. That That's definitely a, te uh, a cacophony of, of texture oh, yeah. there. <laughs> Always go for a cacophony when you're doing a salad. Okay, so now we've got our, this is called supreming. And if you, this is why I like a small knife here. I mean, you could use a big knife, but so you're cutting in between the membranes. You see that? Mm -hmm. And always do it over a bowl. And why? Why? Why do we? Why do, do we do it over a bowl? Because we're going to catch any extra juice that's, you know, we want it. Because actually, we're going to use this juice in the recipe, and it's just a waste to have it all over the cutting board. I mean, yeah, all over the cutting board. You want to okay. capture it. And, and a mess. That's the main way. Yeah, yeah, just for a messy reason. So yeah. you just want to go as close as you can to that membrane. So the idea is to get the beautiful pieces of citrus without really any of the, the membrane uh, getting in the way. And you can do this with any citrus, correct? Any citrus. I mean, it's harder with like, you can't really do it with like, say, a clementine, because that's designed to be sectioned in a different way. I mean, designed, I should say. But it really is. It's like when they grow it, that's meant to be eaten in a different way. But other than that, yes, any kind of grapefruit, even lemons and limes, if you want to put a little bit of, you know, fresh lemon. All right, I got to wait. I have to check my, uh, my thing here. <laughs> so so are there, while you're doing that, are there yeah. any particular citruses that don't go well on this? Day? Not really. I would I'd say you can use absolutely anything. I mean, I just, I, a fennel and orange is a very classic combination. Mm -hmm. So do you see how much color I have on my fennel? It's, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Now, is that from the fennel itself or the no, butter it's or from, the honey? Well, the butter, everything. The butter and the honey and the heat level. Okay. But you don't want to burn it. That's why I just stopped because that's like gorgeous. You want this amount of color. But you don't want to. This is like perfect. Um, so you were busy. You were yeah. busy supreming the orange, and yeah. then you 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 said, "Oh, I've got to check that fennel." So how did you know? Was it smell? <laughs> was it hearing? What's your trick? Well, I did see it, but it is also smell. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've caught things burning in the oven because just because it's six, it's a sixth sense for me. I've been doing this for so long that you know part of it is. Um, just a feeling, <laughs> just okay. my, my instinct. But I did, I think I smelled it first and then I looked over and I saw that it was getting a little bit dark. So I just threw down my Supreme. And don't forget when someone like me is doing this like on camera, 
I've got one more thing to think about, right? Right, and and my throwing questions at you. Yeah, which is fine. But so okay, here's the so you can still see this. Okay, so once you get down to this part, you're going to squeeze all the juice out of it. We don't want to waste any of it. Wonderful. And then it's just really dry, and then it can just go in the compost heap. <laughs> Great, and then you use the juice in the recipe, so you're not wasting anything. Right? Yeah, uh -huh. not wasting any so, of it. You were saying that this is a natural combination and I've had yeah. some um, raw versions of this. So uh -huh, uh -huh. outside of cooking and braising your fennel, could we right. do the same thing with the, the all, I believe you had olives and yeah. fennel on. Could this yeah. become a, um, a cold dish with the fancy mandolin? Um, yes, absolutely. You could make a fennel and orange salad instead of braising the fat, the, the, um, fennel and you could make a dressing with the uh the extra orange juice and the uh an olive oil and you could um also maybe add a little bit of lemon juice because it might not be quite acidic enough with just um just orange juice um and so i would add perhaps a little lemon um just to kick up the acidity but you could yeah it's totally classic combination usually with red onions as well which is, I guess, what really did inspire this dish. So, all right. So this is my second orange. In the recipe, it uses blood oranges, but they are no not in season yet. So okay, great. Well, while you're doing that, I have a question yeah. about okay. your work with movies. I mean, yeah. that's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, and I was reading at one point where you said why you were why this is different because you not only know how to make a cake, but you know how to make 50 cakes that all look the same. <laughs> yes. And what is it like, because, you know, when I make one cake, I feel very accomplished. Right. And oh, <laughs> what, what does it feel like to one, make 50 cakes, and then to see all 50 cakes be cut <laughs> over and over and over again? <laughs> well, I actually haven't done 50 cakes, but I have done at least that many pies and that many roast chickens. Both of those were for It's Complicated um, with Meryl Streep uh, for her character. And, uh, you know, because you only have to make, say, 50 if you have a scene where they're cutting into the cake or cutting off a chicken leg, as it was in the case of uh, it's complicated, um, but you know you basically have to come up with a prototype that that works that you then know you can you know keep keep replicating. So mm -hmm. that's that's really what it what it comes down to is. Um, I mean, usually you have to when you're working on a film set, you have to get approval. So you have to make and say here's here's a prototype of the pie. Usually, not always. All right, wait, I have to go to this for one second. Do you see how the fennel is getting nice and soft? Mm -hmm. okay. And the okay. color is just lovely. Yeah. So that's what we want. And then we're going to add a cup of stock. And this could be vegetable stock or chicken stock or whatever you have. And this is going to make the fennel go all the way to very soft. And we're going to add any citrus juice that we have. Now, that might seem like a lot, but we're going to kind of um we're basically braising the fennel this is braising so um it doesn't say braising in the recipe but that's what it is and it it, it makes fennel take on a completely different character than when it's raw it's it's soft and unctuous and it has like a very different flavor than raw fennel so um so i recommend trying has it. a very anise sort yeah. of flavor does that tone down when you cook it, it does it goes a little bit more into the background um mm -hmm. and you taste other things first, so um, yeah. And does it get <laughs> like dish. cabbage gets really sweet when it cooks? Does fennel? It does. It does. It, well, it is naturally sweet, but it does bring out the sweetness. So yes, it becomes sweet, and that anise flavor is is less pronounced for sure. All That's right, excuse And I have a question about styling. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are the trends? Like you see uh, trends come through. What, yeah, what are the sure. trends now and what do you foresee in the future? <laughs> uh, well, the trends for quite a while now, for one thing, is shooting straight overhead. 
as you've noticed, most of the pictures in my book are. I mean, when I first started, there was a lot of like deep three quarter angles that we would shoot at because sometimes it was more about an environment and a scene and let's focus on the food itself. Um, nowadays, we shoot really, really sort of tight and top down like this. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the, the trends in just food photography. Um, but as far as styling, I think, you know, what's mostly in style is still a very kind of natural look um, where like, again, in this photo of something, it's not like a complete dish. You see, I've already spooned some out and you look like you're really like there, you're really in the moment. So I think making things look that way where it just looks so um, natural, like it just floated down from heaven and landed on the plate is um, I think very much in style still, but there's also another trend of things being very kind of um, almost tightly controlled and crazy like neon colors and, not so real. That's that's the other trend that I think you'll see out there, especially if you're looking at Instagram. You'll see um, things that are sort of very much the opposite of what I'm describing. So you know, there's never only one thing happening at a time. Okay. Um, and I think those those are the two things that are happening. <laughs> so um, since we have some time while we're waiting for yeah. the funnel to, to braise and get creamy, as you said, uh -huh. um, what are some challenges that you faced on a movie oh. set? I, oh I kind of remember hearing <laughs> something about cobblestones or, <laughs> and weather. Uh, well, okay. I mean, you might, you might be thinking about um, when I, I did an interview that was about Eat, Pray, Love, which uh, the, the challenges of working on a movie like Eat, Pray, Love is that we were, basically on location in Rome. And that that was a challenge. <laughs> um, I didn't have like a nice, comfortable soundstage that I was working in my nice, comfortable kitchen. No, I was, you know, basically prepping wherever I could. And sometimes my assistant who actually lived in Rome would have to go home and cook something in his home kitchen because we didn't really have a kitchen. One day, For one big scene, we had a kitchen truck but that was only like one day. And because Rome, the streets are so narrow, we couldn't have a, a kitchen truck, which you would normally have on set, just wasn't room for it. And so it was very fly by the seat of our pants and we shot mostly in restaurants. So we would somehow, have, we had a little refrigerated truck where we keep our food and then we'd pull up to the restaurant and get into the kitchen and just start cooking. <laughs> So yeah, that was really challenging. And then sometimes, yes, running around with all of the paparazzi and the people watching and looking for Julia Roberts and it was just kind of insane. And then running across cobblestone. They're like, oh, it's only 200 meters away. And it's like, I'm, I'm American. I don't even know how, think, I can't think in meters. So <laughs> and they're like, oh, it's really close, but it really was like down the street. So one person's close is another person's very far <laughs> away. <laughs> Especially if you're holding food and trying not to. Oh my it. God, it's it. crazy. So yeah, I say you pray love. There, there are, basically, it's all about challenges. Every single thing when you're doing a movie is a challenge. And how are you going to um, kind of get around the challenge for everyone on a movie set? That's what it's all about. Um, in fact, that like if you work with people on a movie set, like people say, this is what they say, um, everything's going to be great. <laughs> And they say that when they don't think it's actually going to be great. But it's like you had to have to keep this very positive attitude. They're asking. I mean, it's, like, it's like, even though, even when especially, you know, it's just, it's not going to be, it's going to, you're worried about how it's all going to turn out. Everything's going to be great. <laughs> great. So do you see what's happening here? It looks like it's thickening up and creating yeah. a really Isn't that gorgeous. Sauce? Yeah. And look how fast that was. Oh my God. And that's what you want. Now that little bit of honey and the butter is what's really helping that sort of caramel to form. And you want it like, you don't want to burn it. This is the point where you have to watch it like a hawk because it could burn very, very easily. So we're almost done. I'm going to go grab a platter. I'm going to actually turn it off because I think it's done. So is this another dish? Oh, well. 
We'll wait for her to come back. Okay. I was wondering if this is another dish that might be able to be served room temperature. Absolutely. Like, I think when we were talking about it, we said, oh, it's a salad. And I was like, well, it's really a salad. But um, I was actually looking for the platter. Oh, I don't know where it is. I was looking for the platter that I used for the book, but I don't see it. So those are mostly my prop. Yeah, this would also be great at room temperature. I mean, I love it with the kind of hot, cold thing going on. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm just going to remove our my... Are the olives um, pitted or are do they stay? Yeah, pitted? these came pitted. So I'm going to show you that in one second. I usually get unpitted olives. That's like a food stylist thing because you don't want like this big obvious hole in it. Like it's they look better if you just kind of tear them out, you know, <laughs> yourself. But honestly, yesterday I just didn't see any that had pits when I was shopping. So I just okay, bought and those. Is there a trick of unpitting an olive? Yeah, well, they're so easy to pit when, like something like a Kalamata olive is so soft that you can just sort of tear it apart with your fingers <laughs> in half. Or you take the side of your knife and you just press down on it. Oh, okay. And then, and then you can just sort of remove the pit. That's so this good. platter looks good too. Now, I don't want to lose any of this delicious liquid so i'm going to take my scraper i used to work with a uh, sous chef that used to go around the kitchen and say you left 20 cents in the bowl <laughs> <laughs> but look at all that good stuff if you didn't uh yeah well i mean that's the honey and all the flavors yeah. right there right? you want that, you want that. um get rid of that. i have so another now, question I, here while you sure. finish off yeah. The dish. Um, what are some of your favorite recipes that you meal prep or some type uh, of food that tastes okay after being in the fridge for a few days or close <laughs> to a week? <laughs> well, again, I have to come back to soups, <laughs> but also I do eat meat. So I, I, I make this like a meat mixture that can be used for turkey burgers or meatballs or, um, uh, you know, mostly those two things. And I use the, I, I keep the, the meat mixture in there and then I can form it into whatever I want at the last minute. Um, but, you know, again, I think soups are the best thing to meal prep. I also just make batches of beans and I make the broth if I make them from dry beans and or these days shell beans, fresh shell beans from the market. Once you've cooked beans, you have that broth and all you have to do is saute some onion and carrot and celery and you already have soup. I mean, it's, I can't say enough good things about soup for meal prep because then they, you can put leftovers or like I said before, dumplings, you can put any, things in the soup to make it a bigger meal. Mm -hmm. So even, you know, tofu or it's great if, you know, and yeah, that's, that's what I mostly do when I, I don't meal prep the way some people do, like where they set up, uh, uh, you know, individual meals or entrees. And yeah, I just make batches of things and then I transform them throughout so the week. So you're creating a, a refrigerator full of mise en place that you can kind of mix and match? Or Well, yeah, not so, not really so much mise en place, which would mean just chopped up onions. and But I do do that too. I sometimes just cook. I'll take get one of the giant tubs of spinach. Well, I don't use, like, leave that in my refrigerator taking up all the space, I immediately cook it. And then I've got the wilted spinach. And then I have that ready to put into other meals. And um, I might roast off a bunch of squash or I'll, I'll cook more than I'll always cook more than I need for something so that it can be go into the next meal, whether it's okay. roasted cauliflower, roasted squash, anything like that. That does all make right. Make yeah. it easier. All right. So now we have the olives, which as you can see, not only are going to give it flavor, but a beautiful sort of color contrast. And I saved some of the fennel fronds to sprinkle over too. I washed them. You should wash them. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes people think they don't have to wash things and you should wash most things. <laughs> yeah. And that so has a, a brightness yeah. to the dish. Oh yeah. Both for the flavor and the color. I mean, look at that. It's so pretty. And then this is the piece de resistance. Um, you don't totally don't have to, but there's this very cool thing called fennel pollen. Mm -hmm. 
And I actually have some out on my deck too, because I have fennel plants that have gone to seed. So I could use that. If you are growing fennel, um, you can just use that. So this is just giving it a little bit of extra fennel flavor. Oh, exciting. It's and really in California, a lot of people go and get the wild fennel pollen. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So you can harvest the fennel yourself um, if you're lucky enough to live in California. Stay so away can, from the freeways, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because they're dirty. So, yeah. you know, that looks almost exactly the same. You see that? Oh, wow. That's inspirational because sometimes you wonder if your your dish will look as good as the photo that you, yeah. you're uh, trying yeah. to replicate. Right. Well, There's not really any trickery involved, like the way that I am, the kind of food stylist that I am. There's not really, it's not really about trickery. It's about showing you how beautiful the food is naturally. So, well, you, you've just shown us how, how easy it is to create beautiful food. And hopefully we all learn some photography tricks to uh, showcase on our own Instagram accounts. Yeah. We're um, at about time, so I do okay. want to thank you for spending your, your morning, afternoon with us mm -hmm. and showing us these amazing dishes. Uh, when you get a chance, please get Open Kitchen and even go online because on um, YouTube, there are a lot of videos mm -hmm. with Susan um, on Food 52 and New York Times. And yeah. I do want to do a plug for your cookies <laughs> um, because that was last year and I believe yep. coming back again this year 12 mm -hmm. types of cookies all all of them different and um, amazing for the holiday season so do go online and check out what Susan has out there for us thank you Ida this has been so much fun thank you very much for joining us take care thanks for having me bye bye, -bye.